Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, we cordially welcome you to day two of the first Faculty of Education Annual Conference 2022 at Indonesian International Islamic University. Education in Muslim societies, addressing critical educational issues in a challenging time is the theme of the first Faculty of Education Annual Conference 2022. Yesterday, we have looked at several educational topics from our two keynote speakers, Professor Robert Hafner from Boston University, the United States of America, on how Indonesia became a world leader in Islamic education. And also, Dr. Abdullah Sahin from Warwick University, United Kingdom, on what is an Islamic university. We also had explored further on other educational issues from various perspectives, such as Islamic education and women in education. Today, we will look further into the topic of teaching and learning during the pandemic, higher education, children's education, and gender equality. For this occasion, our agenda is as follow. Day two opening speech by Professor Nina Nurmela, the Dean of the Faculty of Education. Keynote speech by Professor Yukari Amos, uh, pa panel presentations, and closing of the first Faculty of Education Annual Conference 2022. We would like to open day two of the conference with the speech of Professor Nina Nurmila from the Dean as the Dean of the Faculty of Education. To Professor Nina Nurmila, the time and place are yours. Thank you very much, Diva and Hazrat. I'm very proud of both of you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillahirrahmanirrahim. Wassalatu wassalamu ala muhammadin sayyidil mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Rabbi surah li sadri wa yasir li amri wa halul uqdatan milisani yafqahu qali. Amma ba'du. Uh, dearest participants and lectures, I saw Ibu uh, Dr. Tati Wardi, the head of the uh, study program, education study program, and then the lectures, uh, Dr. Didin uh, Safrudin, and then Dr. Destina, Dr. Charina Ayu, and then my students, and then the participants. Uh, I am uh, very glad that you are here on time, uh, before the time, and that's what I noticed from yesterday, that uh, we were being punctual and that's why I want to keep this until the second day and hopefully until the closing. <laughs> yeah. Because being punctual is actually uh, give benefit for those of you who keep discipline themselves in terms of time. Yeah. So we respect those who are coming on time. Yeah. Uh, because we value our time, uh, that's why uh, while waiting for our keynote speaker today who would like to speak about a teacher as a noble profession, which is a very important, uh, I would like to give you some information, which actually I would like to deliver it uh, during the closing ceremony, but uh, since I I'm afraid, <laughs> but uh, hopefully not, uh, uh, usually when it is only only closing people uh, go run away yeah uh, so uh, this is the first annual education conference yeah annual means that we would like or we plan to have it every year yeah so please wait for our next announcements uh, for the second annual education uh, faculty conference yeah and uh, some of the participants here are the, also uh, the participants of the writing competition. So these two activities will keep that annually because we need writings, good quality of writings for our journal, yeah, uh, MER, yeah, uh, Muslim Education Review, yeah. When I was young, <laughs> I am not only young, no. <laughs> well, at least I am more senior than you. Uh, I was active in uh, responding to call for paper because by responding to call for paper, right after I see the flyer, 
I have ideas what to write. And then there is a deadline. So this means we have external forces for us to write. And then when I write based on the term of the conference, then uh, we have, okay, we have the deadline and we submit it. And then we have exposure during the conference uh, to many feedbacks of our draft, of our writings, yeah. Other than that, there are many benefits of attending conference. So we know this person from that institution, we know this person from that institution. So we add our friends, yeah. So like in this case, I, uh, at the moment at Triple IU, as the newly established university, Actually, I have known like Professor Nur Haidi, the Dean of the Islamic Studies and the Secretary, Yanwar Pribadi. I think it's like years back, like 2010, when we were attending the same conference. But, and because we were attending the same conference, we know each other's ideas so we can, for example, approach each other to someone whose, in, whose research interests are close to us. Yeah. So with uh, this plan of be having annual conference, annual writing competition, uh, you, at least if you are the regular participants, you will keep producing your writing uh, every year. Yeah. And because uh, uh, this one is our first annual conference, yeah, uh, we admit that there might be many things that we need to learn from this experience. And after this conference, uh, our staff, Nadia, will send you uh, the survey yeah, about the program, about the dormitory, the facilities. Please spend your time to respond to that survey to give us feedback on how to make the conference for the next year is better. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, that's all from me. Uh, well, Sorry, uh, before that, uh, I would like to reflect a little bit about what Professor Emmy Emilia uh, delivered uh, yesterday. Yeah, uh, I was attending not all of them, but I hope you were being energized, motivated by what Professor uh, Emmy Emilia uh, told us. Yeah, uh, I, because I know her personally, uh, I visited uh, her house for example he has she has a house in jakarta and in badung uh, and uh, yesterday she went from uh, her house in jakarta and where i when i visited there yes she always like spreading the books on the bed <laughs> so she is working in her bedroom and then spreading her books and uh, her husband is very supportive even though because of his work she couldn't uh, come to Melbourne to accompany and take care of the two children, but at least the husband has good understanding like, okay, my wife is still working. Okay, I will, uh, if I need to sleep, I need to go to the other room. Yeah, because of the spread of the book and because of the light, etc. Yeah, uh, but what uh, I notice as a gender, uh, I mean, as a person who focus on gender studies, I think I, I am objected to the word permission. I think it is not a, a permission, it is consultation. Yeah, I also do that uh, with my husband. So whatever I do, I always tell, okay, tomorrow I'll do this, 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 this. Next week I'll do this, 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 this. Next month I will do this, 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 this. Next year I will do this, 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 this. So he will understand and not being uh, like, okay, I want this, this, this too. <laughs> so he's adjusting to what we are doing. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, I have also now a couple here, like Professor Nur Haidi and uh, uh, his wife, also a professor. I think uh, we need also to learn with uh, the arrangement when both are the scholars. Yeah. Uh, that's the important thing also for you who are still single in finding your spouse, yeah? <laughs> not to, for example, especially for the women, not to look for someone whose aims in having a marital relationship to put the women 
in a subordinate position who serve the husband. Yeah, I noticed Pak Lutfi is at the back. Thank you for coming, Pak Lutfi. Uh, I think that's all. And if Ibu Tati, the moderator for this morning, would like to say something else uh, to communicate with you, uh, that would be good. But I would like to especially thank to my students for last night performance. I was really entertained, yeah, by the vibrant of your uh, and the message that you deliver with your performance. And Ibu Destina also who. Uh, and Ibu Cherry, who, are, who were in charge of uh, taking care of you to make the uh, what's that to make the performance uh, in place. Yeah, uh, we are very grateful and thank you. And also Palukman, thank you Palukman also for your support. I think that's all from me. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everyone. Uh, salam. Thank you. This is the day two of the conference. Thank you for taking the time to be here earlier. Uh, as the dean said, we try to have the punctual uh, culture, and I think we had a good. Uh, we did. We did a good job yesterday, and we did a good job this morning because we started just at nine a.m. sharp. Uh, and thank you for. Uh, because uh, the keynote speakers uh, wouldn't be here for the until 10 minutes or five minutes hopefully she will be here uh, in five minutes um, i think i would take the opportunity to hear personality from you personally from you what was your impression about yesterday's uh, conference uh, the day one thank you falutpi falutpi is the dean of the economic and business thank you so much uh for being here it is a uh, it's yeah we appreciate that uh so uh we would like to hear from you we would like to have the conference uh, to run well uh, this year and in the future because we would like to have it annually so what what was your impression i would like to hear it from you especially for those who are not from the triple iu you know who you are right <laughs> So we would like to hear humbly, yeah, because we'd like to um, always uh, would like to have it better and better every year, including the students' participation. So, but the group perhaps from Banten, what 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 was your impression? Perhaps something that you would like to comment on from the day one conference. Okay, assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, I think this is a good uh, agenda for uh, university to uh, celebrate the uh, to celebrate the uh, what is it first international conference on educations uh, uh, toward the 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 the, the pandemic era. Uh, I think. Uh, the, the 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 speakers is uh, very impressive so the student is very uh, humble the staff and the lecturer uh, is very welcome so i'm very glad to be here and i think i hope uh next year or, or in the in the future uh, i can come here again in the same agenda thank you miss yes. yeah yeah, I understand Pak Teguh would like to apply for a PhD yeah, uh, here at Triple IU. Hopefully by this year, uh, he'll be one of the Pak Lukman students. <laughs> Pak Lukman is our faculty member. Thank you. Pak Teguh, if I might ask one thing, what, what would you like to see in a conference like this? Either as um, an aspiring scholar and also a, a, a graduate student, if you are aspiring to be a graduate student next year. So, or would you like to see more? Perhaps this year we haven't done so, even though this is only the second day and we haven't started yet. So, what what what, what would you like to see more? Yeah, uh, I would like to see more the the scholar. Uh, gathered in the same agenda, uh, thinking about 
uh, a thing that uh, makes what is it uh, a big impact in education uh, according to pandemic era. So this is not only a conference, but also have a, what is it such a brief uh, a thing uh, uh, such a apa ya. Uh, gagasan oh, what is it? I see I uh -uh. see what you mean yeah uh, yeah. yeah like a policy recommendation like, like perhaps a policy yeah, yeah, like yeah. A policy Some, brief. yeah we can think about that yeah pa. if yeah. in the future that yeah. when we are gathering scholars that's possible we are we can come to an agreement about certain things that need yeah. to be addressed yeah yeah I especially think. because we just started uh, an offline what's yeah. called an offline yeah. uh, conference okay. so thank you thank you for the yeah. suggestion thank you we Ms. definitely can uh, would uh, would like to like uh look into that um uh perhaps uh who would like you are you are staring at me so you would like to say something oh no <laughs> okay how about you uh pa? yeah impressi ya pak so i would like to hear your impression and perhaps something that we can improve yeah in the future assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh mm -hmm. My name is Muhammad Naufal Waliuddin. I came from Huin Sunan Kali Kijaga, Yogyakarta. Mm -hmm. My first impression look at the buildings of Triple IU University. I feel just oh I I'm just a small person in this university. Mm -hmm. It's a bit nervous and so there is insecurity in myself. But after hearing the speech and the material from Prof Emmy Emilia you don't have to be nervous or you don't have to be insecure because we have just to self-confidence but overall i just it's such an honor to be here to participate in this great and incredible conference and i hope previously i i have submitted my paper in writing competition but i fail yeah <laughs> but the next failing, one yeah, the next one because i just I just wrote my paper in just three days because the deadline. I just know the the information, but I love writing because of that. I do my best try to submit the paper, and fortunately, after I fail, so I have been invited to attend this conference. And so encourage you encourage to write me. more and yes. take the time to write yes. your paper because i have the big opportunity to practice in speaking english because it's it is my weakness okay. i have i confident with my reading and my perhaps writing but in speaking i just have no atmosphere like that in uin sunan kalijaga it's just in general studium general something like this and thank you very much for the committee for the wonderful facility in the triple iu dormitory yeah. which is i compare with myself three cross three meters because which yeah. is blend room living room right up here and this is the kitchen my kitchen is my library my personal library in yogyakarta right. so it's such an honor to be here so and student of much. the triple iu should be Proud of grateful, yourself. You, you have been very privileged, yeah, yes. uh, to study here and to even be provided yes. uh, with such perhaps, a luxurious Dr. facility. Rati, I have one suggest, perhaps. Yeah, suggestion. Yes. So, yeah, we'd like to hear from you. What's a group or Telegram? For what? <laughs> For this conference. Participate. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. We have like thousands of WhatsApp groups. Yeah, so we need to be more specific. What's the aim of such group? All right. Thank, Thank you, you, though, for the suggestion. Uh, but I think I can hear the message that uh, you would like to hear. You would like to be uh, in in a community. Yeah. Yeah, to create such a community, especially those who are coming here as a participant. Definitely, perhaps in the future, we have an app that uh, can facilitate the discussion yeah, among the participants, the presenter, and also the attendances. We can definitely have to look into that. Thank you, Pak. Again, Naufal, sorry. Naufal. Oh, Naufal. Oh, 
Naufal ya? Naufal. Naufal, oke. Okay. Um, I'm gonna invite Ibu, <laughs> Ibu from UIN Jakarta, my Valinda. Uh, uh, I would like to hear more from you, Ibu. Uh, you are experienced, of course. Uh, by the way, uh, we've been talking about the welcome Professor Yukari Amos uh, and the family. Okay, I'm glad you guys here. Take the time, catch your breath. I know uh, it seems like the traffic was really bad. Uh, yeah, take the time. I'll give you the time for you to just uh, keep yourself together. Uh, especially what was your impression ibu my valinda and then uh, what would you like to see more to uh, in in an international conference such as this because indeed our aim is to have an international a true international conference uh, so please i would like to to hear from you thank you uh, miss tati assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Uh, saya am Maya Valinda Fatra from uh, State Islamic University Jakarta. Ya, yeah, I am very impressive uh, to the first conference, international conference in uh, uh, I uh, I triple U. Uh, I hope the next uh, the next session have many uh, uh, resource like uh, narasumber uh, from the other country. Uh, to give uh, some uh, inspiring for a special graduate uh, student. Uh, I, uh, I hope uh, the first uh, conference uh, based for a uh, good idea, uh, the start from uh, reading thesis for a graduate student. I think that, and the facilities is very good. I think uh, the facilities in uh, I, uh, three, uh, triple, uh, triple IU, IU. Uh, based and similar with the other uh, country abroad uh, abroad country like uh, it's comparable yeah, yeah? Yes. or international like, yeah, like university Malaysia, like i'm Thailand glad to and, hear yeah i think that thank okay, you thank you i also to, uh, like to thank our staff and then all the students as well they are working really hard to make this happen uh yes i can hear from you that uh, that in the future the graduate forum i think you are referring to that yeah indeed graduate forum will be something that we would uh, have it uh, we would like to extend it perhaps in two days yeah we'll have a two days graduate forum where there is an opportunity for graduate students to present to have session about research methodology and also about writing thesis and dissertation so we would like to have more time for graduate student to have uh, the opportunities yeah to learn uh, uh, from the expert or for more experienced uh, speakers thank you ibu my valinda you're welcome yeah is professor yukari ready yeah you can come down thank you Uh, Himiko and Daniel, you want to come down? Take a front seat. Okay, thank you very much uh, for Professor Nina Nurmira earlier for the opening remarks, as well as from Dr. Tati for such interactive and communicative discussion with our participants. <laughs> Okay, now we would like to open uh, the day two of the conference with the speech of Professor Yukari Amos from Central Washington University, the United States of America on teaching is a noble profession. This discussion will be moderated by Dr. Tati Diwardi, the head of the MA program at Triple IU's Faculty of Education. For the speaker and moderator, the floor and time are yours. Thank you, Diva, and thank you, Hazra. Those are my lovely students. They have been working really hard. They're practicing yesterday and today, this morning, they arrived one hour earlier just to get to, uh, to practice and practice, make things better. That's the spirit that I would like to see uh, with my students, yeah? Uh, the triple IU students are hardworking people, yeah? They deserve to be here. But anyway, uh, thank you for everyone uh, who uh, 
took the time to get here early and to be on time. Again, uh, this is a, a culture that we would like to keep in our university to have it on time. Um, it's very wonderful to have Professor Yukari Amos. Uh, I'll consider her a friend because I've been knowing her for many, many years. <laughs> uh, we met uh, a true uh, a book project, yeah. Uh, uh, Professor Yurkari edited a book and then I got um, selected my chapter to be published in her book. And uh, Daniel Amos was one of the uh, co editors. So from there, we developed a friendship. I guess they visited uh, my university when I was at uh, State in, uh, Islamic University, uh, Sharif Dayatullah. So, so actually they were there presenting um, a speech, yeah. Uh, so this will be the second time, but this time they're uh, invited us for special uh, occasion that is a conference. Uh, today, um, today's conference, uh, uh, the, for the day two, we are focusing on something that's dear to my heart as teacher education. Um, Professor Rika is an expert, and I'm going to read her biography, uh, her bio, but it's this, this thick, yeah, it's impossible to read it, uh, to finish it. So I'm going to pick something that perhaps uh, relevant today. So the name is Yukari Takimoto Amos, yeah, Takimoto, that's a correct name, PhD. Uh, she is a professor and chair of Department of Education, Development, Teaching and Learning. This is very relevant to one of our concentration. Um, from the Central Washington University, uh, uh, Washington State, yeah. Um, she got a PhD from the University of Washington, Seattle, one of a very good school uh, at UW, what we call it, UW. <laughs> I've been to that university, it's very lovely, uh, spacious, a lot of, uh, yeah, greeneries, just like our university uh, in a smaller scale. <laughs> but that university is really huge, right? How many hectares do you have? At the university we have like 148 hectares here if that's the same so it's comparable yeah the triple iu more, more buildings oh, yeah. more buildings more yeah we'll, we'll have more building in the future <laughs> <laughs> maximum 30 percent. that's right a lot more trees greeneries and stuff yeah um phd oh you got the phd from kobe university i didn't know that uh, i I went there, but I didn't finish the PhD oh, you didn't because be uh, then I candidate. finished at the UDA. All right. And you got the MA from Japan, Kyoto, Don, Doshisha, Doshisha University, American Studies Graduate School of American Studies, and the BA from Kobe University, City University. Uh, as of now, uh, she's currently a chair. Yeah. Uh, so she's uh, like me and Professor Nina, actually, you know, administrator and also faculty member. Um, she's um, administrative leadership accomplishment, also full professor. Full professor is not easy in the US. So a professor you carry again, a full professorship, meaning that a very accomplished person. Uh, um, also work uh, at the ESL program coordinator and teacher and what else. So she worked closely with teachers and doing research with teachers. A publication, I can see she's been authoring a lot of books, including the recent, the most recent one in 2018, Latina Bilingual Education Teacher, yeah, uh, examining structural racism in school. This is one of the, her strength, uh, her, yeah, uh, expertise, yeah, actually. Uh, and then this is the book that been then co-edited when uh, I contributed the chapter that is with uh, Daniel Amos called Children's Literature from Asia in Today's Classroom. It was uh, towards uh, culturally authentic interpretation, uh, published in 2018. What else? Uh, chapters in book, many, and then, of course, uh, uh, journal publication uh, as you can tell and then recently she just published newsletter articles uh, in literacy today it was lovely my friends love it literacy expert here very very like it yeah you you gave a, a a very interesting point of view in that edition yeah so thank you for for writing that uh, without further ado uh, i would like to invite professor yukari amos to uh, to deliver her prepared uh, speech uh, in a PowerPoint. So uh, you can check the podium, Professor Yukari. Do, do we have PowerPoints? PowerPoints, yeah. Can yes. you? Yeah, PowerPoint is up, actually. Yeah, you can just go to the uh, podium. May, may I speak over yes, there? Of course, that's for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Ya. Silakan. Yes, thank you. So, who is going to move the pop? Yeah, you have the clicker. The oh, clicker right I have a clicker. Oh, I'm so sorry about the PowerPoint things. <laughs> so my husband is going to move the slide forwards or backwards. <laughs> well, thank you very much for uh, coming to my speech. And uh, my name is Yukari Moro. Amos. My name is Yukari Takimoto Amos. Takimoto is my maiden name. From ja I'm from Japan. I'm Japanese and. Most uh, Japanese people do have only first name and the last name, but in America, most Americans do have a middle name. So I attached my middle name as a middle name <laughs> when I married to him. So I'm a professor in the department chair at Central Washington University, Washington, USA. Washington means it's not Washington DC on the East Coast, Washington is on the West Coast, far Northwest Coast. So my speech is about today, about the teaching profession itself. I thought about it because I'm a professor in a teacher education and all of you are a staff member or a student. So I thought that this topic would be more generally interested to all of you. But before I begin, uh, I would like to share a very, very sad story that happened uh, recently back in the United States. Uh, most of you probably know that uh, an 18 year old high school uh, student randomly shot 19 school children and two teachers at an elementary school in Texas. And so basically 21 people were dead. So these people are just randomly shot uh, because of this one 18 year old high school student. And it's a uh, part of the gun violence the United States always has, and it's really a sad story. And if you are okay with me, I would like to request a moment of silence a little bit. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Next, please. So let me talk about the teacher uh, teaching profession itself. So my topic is uh, teaching, what a noble profession. Teaching is a noble profession, uh, even if you don't think that way, but lots of people think it's a teaching is a noble profession. So research has shown that the most important factor in terms of, uh, in terms of, excuse me, in terms of student achievement is a teacher. So there is a clear relationship between students learning and the quality of their teachers. A weak teacher can actually have a deleterious impact on learners. You probably still remember when you had a not so good teacher, you didn't think you learned much, correct? So teachers impart knowledge necessary for the young generation to survive, prosper, and improve in our society. So possibly this task could be done by robots, for example, but machines are not capable of attending to and nurturing students' physical, emotional, and social development. Only human teachers can do this. That's why teacher, teaching goes beyond disseminating knowledge. It involves all dimensions of human development. Whether or not our society advances in the future depends on what the young generation does and how they behave. So the influences of teachers are significant, which is why teaching is called a noble profession. Next, please. So in such a noble profession called teaching, what makes one a good teacher? Have you ever wondered about this? What makes one a good teacher? Next, please. So teachers of high quality produce favorable educational outcome. Traditionally, research on teacher quality has been focused on two factors, the cognitive capabilities of people who enter the teaching career. Another is the professional knowledge acquired during teacher education. 
So the former, those who emphasize the cognitive capabilities of teachers say that the bright and well-educated people make the best teachers. This is called a bright people hypothesis. The researchers on this focus hypothesize that because they are smart and thoughtful enough, they are able to figure out the nuances of teaching in the process of doing it. In other words, in order for teachers to teach well, teachers need to be smart and intelligent. However, the study conducted by Cantor and her colleagues refute this hypothesis. They found that teachers' general academic ability did not affect their instruction at all. So professional knowledge instead seemed to be more important than general attributes to make one a good teacher. This is called the knowledgeable teacher hypothesis. So this hypothesis said that professional specific knowledge is a key factor in teacher quality. And this type of knowledge is not everyday knowledge. It's a highly specialized knowledge that is shared among a community of professionals. It is acquired in formal and professional profession specific learning environments and refined in discourse with other experts, such as during a teacher preparation program. However, knowledge alone does not sufficiently explain the differences in teachers' behaviors and success. For example, even if teachers possess similar professional knowledge through similar teacher preparation programs, how they instruct and how much their instruction contributes to student success are all different. As we already know, two different teachers candidates in the same teacher preparation program can make very different teachers. So why do these differences occur? Next, please. Key aspects that determine teacher quality appear to be professional competence, which includes beliefs, motivations, and self-regulation, in addition to field-specific knowledge. Teachers' beliefs influence the behavior in the classroom. Beliefs affect the way they teach and the kinds of learning environment they create. If you as a teacher believes that every student will be successful, you will naturally create a learning environment to make that happen, correct? On the other hand, if you believe that some students will not be successful, your belief will naturally transform into your behavior in which you may not have high expectations of certain students. Teachers who have a passion for teaching and regard teaching as intrinsically motivating, rewarding, provide students with, with more support, which in turn has a favorable impact on the student's motivation. If you as a teacher, if you as a teacher are motivated to make a student successful, your motivation will motivate your students reciprocally. In addition, successful teachers learn to cope with the constant demand of their work and stressful uh, situations by regulating their engagement. Oops, I'm sorry. Teaching is our job. If we don't know how to regulate our job efficiently and instead suf suffering from anxiety and stress, always complaining and not being able to grade on time, how well do you think we can teach? In other words, professional knowledge alone doesn't make one a good teacher. A good teacher must possess beliefs, motivations, suitable for student success, and must be able to manage their job appropriately. Next, please. Then what about us who are here? Teacher educators, or future teacher educators or teachers to be. What makes one a good teacher educator? A teacher educator is someone who provides instruction or who gives guidance and support to teacher candidate. A teacher educator renders a substantial contribution to the development of students into competent teachers. How does a teacher education make students competent teachers? A teacher educator replicates teaching strategies from his or her own past, and in doing so, pass this legacy on to their pre-service teachers. In other words, quality teacher 
education relies on quality teacher educators. So 30 years ago, the academy in higher education casually functioned via the myth that college and university faculty professors only needed, to, needed expertise in their disciplines in order to be good teachers, or in order to be good professors. A chemistry professor needs the knowledge in the field of chemistry, for example, but does not necessarily need pedagogical knowledge and skills. Beginning in the 1970s, this myth was challenged by various sectors, both within and without the academy. College instructors have become increasingly aware of the paradigm shift between providing instruction and providing learning. We now have uh, interest in the development of teaching competence in faculty, in other words, professors, beyond a simple subject matter expertise. Researchers have now begun to examine college faculty pedagogical beliefs, decisions, and judgments during teaching in a systematic way. This aligns well with the importance of professional competence for school teachers I just described before. Next, please. In this context, what teachers know has become a focal point. So Fernandez Barbova still identified generic components of pedagogical content knowledge that includes knowledge about the subject matter, knowledge about students, knowledge about instructional strategy, knowledge about teaching context, and knowledge about teaching purposes. At its core, good teaching involves the interweaving of content knowledge, ped pedagogy skill, and the knowledge and appreciation of the complex nature of students to be able to point to evidence that learning has occurred. So you may have now realized that uh, we are now focusing on what students learn after being instructed by professors like us, rather than what professors teach to students. Do you see a paradigm shift? And do you see the difference, these two? Next, please. So we teacher educators uh, develop pedagogical content knowledge through studying, by doing and reflecting, and by collaborating with other teachers, by looking closely at students, their work, and by starring, by sharing what they see. Stark also found that faculty members' disciplinary beliefs about knowledge in their discipline were the strongest influence on planning at the course and lesson levels. In a reciprocal fashion, teachers' expectations about how students learn and what they should learn directly affect their teaching approaches, even within a tightly defined subject matter context. Next, please. So Schumann, who is a big, uh, who is a big guy in the teacher education, uh, I don't think so. This one, yeah. yeah. Uh, Sherman suggests that essential feature of pedagogical content knowledge is that it is something communicated. So McGuinn and Ball are aware and are sympathetic to the idea that knowledge is pedagogic. However, they argue that there can be no content knowledge without a pedagogical dimension because the understanding and the communication of an idea itself is pedagogical act. They go on to say that to understand a new idea is not merely to add to the existing stock. It is also a grasp hold of this heuristic power. It's power to teach. Explanations are not only of something, they are also always for someone, which means needs to be communicated. So this corresponds with Border and Dorfman's assertion that while knowledge is important, the ability to deliver that knowledge is equally, if not more, important. Student experts, uh, students expect professors to be uh, deeply knowledgeable and have the ability to teach it to them in a meaningful, engaging manner. Professors whom they believe depend excessively on PowerPoint presentation, packets of material, or book or lecture notes are generally criticized. Why? It's because 
those professors are not communicating to students. Remember, in order for students to learn, teachers must communicate their knowledge to the students, doing only lectures and using only PowerPoint slides, giving students only materials and having them read assigned pages of the textbook will not be considered communicative. A focus on pedagogical content knowledge naturally makes college professors become more student-centered, correct? This is why student learning has become a more important pedagogical design for faculty members like us professors. Next, please. So if we have shifted our focus to what students actually learn from us, and adopt the student-centered approach to teaching, it's reasonable to ask what type of professors students want to learn from. So research concludes that students like professors to be approachable, enthusiastic, available for discussion, and able to be a good thought. For example, a professor likes to intimidate students, he or she is not considered approachable. If a professor is always tired, he or she is not considered enthusiastic. If a professor refuses to engage him or self in library discussion in classroom, he or she is, not, is considered not thinking about student learning. Remember, knowledge needs to be communicated. In order to communicate, students require discussions to clarify the confusions and advance their thinking. If a professor is not approachable, he or she cannot give, uh, build a good rapport with students. The most important quality of professors is, according to students themselves, that professors treat students respectfully and compassionately. Although there is a hierarchy between professors and students, of course, and students are lower in this hierarchy, that doesn't mean that we professors can disrespect, disrespect students. Thanks, please. So students also like professors who are organized in teaching. Elements of organization and ability to teach in a seamless fashion are important to students. How the instruction flows in one class time really depends on how a professor manages his or her time. A good professor's class flows naturally and seamlessly without disruption. In a not so good professor's class, uh, students have a hard time figuring out what is happening in the class. Students are also keenly interested in having syllabi explained, questions answered, and course requirements discussed. It's also important to them that assignments be meaningful where students have a voice in the work itself uh, with which they are actively involved. They're also interested in having classwork be applicable to their work in their own future classroom. One of the most vital roles for faculty, a professor, is to engage in teaching, focus on active, meaningful learning. Students are particularly in incensed uh, if feedback on their work is limited or non-existent. Students seem to have a real sense that feedback, which is formative and prompt, Im improves their work. Feedback and active involvement are both key criteria as good teaching practices in college education. Feedback is a communication, and communication is essential in good teaching. Students also depend on their professors as teacher educators to teach them the fundamental goal, fundamentals of good teaching and to practice what they preach. Remember, our teacher candidates, which watch our everyday single movement of instruction and try to emulate that every single move. Next, please. So now, uh, I must ask all of you here a uh, question, this question. Are you a good teacher educator? Are you a good teacher to be? Yes. <laughs> uh, so, could you uh, could you briefly talk to your colleagues next sitting next to you? Uh, what do you think about your own teaching? Are you a good teacher? Are you going to be a good teacher educator? Could you briefly talk to each other? Yeah. 
Yeah. Talk to someone next to you. Do you think you are a good teacher <laughs> educator? <laughs> Did you did you talk? Okay, let's move on. I'll give you more time to talk to each other uh, later on. Next, please. So now that uh, you have begun thinking about your own teaching quality, let's do some exercise. <laughs> As I said before, in order for us to be student-centered, student -centered, we must be approachable, enthusiastic, available for discussion, build a good rapport, and treat students with respect. We also need to have students' questions answered, course requirements assignments explained clearly, assignments are meaningful, and give feedback on students' assignment. In summary, we need to communicate our knowledge, what we know, to students effectively. So this exercise is a fun exercise. So from the next slide, I will introduce you to five different professors. For each professor, students give feedback on the quality of the instruction in the form of the end of the quarter student evaluation of instructors. I heard that the you uh, in this university do the same thing too. So this student evaluation is widely used in the United States higher education to improve the professor's teaching skill. So for each professor, I want you to identify what characteristics they are missing to be considered good instructor. Are you ready? Next, please. So this is Professor Wan. So can you read it? Yeah. And after you read the professor's characteristic, please, please talk to each other sitting next to you. What this professor is missing to be considered a good instructor. No, that. Yeah. Any idea what this professor is missing to be considered a good instructor? Huh? <laughs> Anybody else? What, what is this professor is missing to be considered a good instructor? Approachable, approachability, mm -hmm. okay. Approachability, that's one thing. Okay, anything else? That's good, doesn't have, uh, doesn't respect students. Anybody else? Yes, that's good, that's true, I agree. Anybody else? Okay, let's move on to Professor Two. What about this professor? What, what is this professor missing? Sounds like a person. 
What do you think? What is this professor missing to be considered a good instructor? Anybody? Uh huh. <laughs> Anyone? Anyone in the back? She, she doesn't have empathy. That's a good point. I agree. Empathy is really necessary, isn't it? Excellent. Yes. Uh, we have three more. So to Professor Three. What do you what do you think about this professor? What is she missing? <laughs> arrogant? Yeah, she she seems arrogant. That's true. Uh, but why is arrogant so bad? Why being arrogant so bad to be a good professor, particularly in teacher education? Uh huh. And this professor doesn't look like respecting students' ideas, correct? Because her idea is the best one, and it's either her idea or no way, correct? So that is not called learning. Students do learn by talking, discussing with professors, correct? So if there's no such a discussion occurring, of course, students are not going to learn, right? Okay, let's move on to Professor Four. What do you think about this professor? Is this professor organized? No, it doesn't look like it. What about her grading? Is it systematic? No, correct. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't look like she's giving feedback either, correct? If a professor doesn't give you any feedback, you shouldn't do any assignment either, in my opinion, because with the feedback given by the professor, you will learn, correct? And you will move forward. And the last one, this professor. this such professor? <laughs> what do you think about this professor? What? <laughs> Any, anybody, any thought about this professor? By the way, these all five professors are real, real people. Yes. Because these are feedback, I got them all from real students, actually. And this particular professor number five is an extremely popular professor. Students love him. Students love him, really. But students also write these comments. So what do you think about this professor? What's happening in his classroom if you are a student? Maybe an easy grade. He's an easy grader, so everybody gets an A. So that's why students love him, correct? But, <laughs> but think about it. 
Is learning happening in this professor's classroom? Do you think so? No. Why not? No resource. Oh, no engagement, correct? No textbook, correct? No, no reading assignment. Although you get an easy A, you are not learning. You're just sitting here physically, wasting your time, wasting your valuable brain time, correct? So again, these are all real professors and these are all real students' feedback. Next, please. Uh, not this one, you skipped it. Yeah, backward. No. Backward, backward again. Yes, so student evaluation of college professors' instruction is sometimes criticized for its lack of objectivity. Some students make harsh comments uh, to professors simply because they don't like the professors. <laughs> and some students make positive comments because the professors give them easy assignment and good grades, just like professor number five. Although there are many problems attached to student evaluation, it's also important to use a student's com comments constructively. For example, is there a pattern in the comments your students make? For example, if you receive a comment like, this professor doesn't clearly explain the assignment over and over and again, you probably should reflect upon if you have been really explaining the assignment until your students know what to do. And for that case, have your trusted colleagues observe your class for this purpose? Have you ever done this before? Have you ever done peer observation or peer evaluation in your entire life? when you teach in higher education or a K-12 system. It's a good, good practice to have somebody observe your teaching and have, you, have them critique your teaching. It's a very good exercise to make you become a very good teacher. And are you letting your students know that you are willing to improve your instruction? Many students lament that, oh, well, no matter what feedback we give to professor, they won't change at all. What's the point? Uh, well, if you are serious about producing quality teachers, don't you think we ourselves should be serious about being teacher educators with high quality, correct? Let's not be afraid. Let's talk to students and ask how we can improve our teaching. I am sure the students will appreciate our willingness to improve, Remember, quality teacher education relies on quality teacher educators. Next, please. So let's make a quick summary. There are two different approaches to teaching, traditional and outcome-based. Traditional teachers used to plan their teaching by asking students questions. What topics or content do I teach? What teaching methods do I use? How do I assess to see if the students have taken on board what I have taught them? Teaching here is conceived as a process of transmitting content to the student. So the methods tend to be expository and assessment focus on checking how well the message has been received. Therefore, the common use of lectures and demonstrations with tutorials for clarification and exams that rely on reporting back. However, once you start thinking about students' well-being in your class and adopting a student-centered approach, you will again naturally lead to outcomes-based teaching. Outcomes-based teaching is based on such questions as, what do I intend my students to be able to do after my teaching? that they couldn't do before. And to what standard? How do I supply learning activity that will help them achieve those outcomes? How do I assess them to see how well they have achieved them? Do you see differences between these two approaches? So I want you to talk to each other again and sitting next to you. Then I want you to talk about what the difference is between these two approaches.
So what do you think? What are some differences you see between these two different approaches? Anybody? Anybody from the back or in the middle? Mm -hmm. True. Yes, that's true. Anybody else? Yes. So in the United States, uh, more and more professors in higher education are going to be based upon the outcomes-based approach from the traditional approach, which means more and more student-centered. So you are, if you are students right now, who are students right now? Student? Yes. OK. So your voice is important in higher education. You should, you have to voice your opinion about your professor's teaching. Naturally, that will improve the professor's teaching, correct? Outcomes-based approach is really different from traditional one. You as students actually, of course, professors convey knowledge, correct? Because we have PhD or ED, we have a doctorate degree, we have tons of, bunch of knowledge to give to you. But it's really up to you to actually use that knowledge because our job as a professor is to have you advance in terms of knowledge by doing lots and lots of things. So student teachers, of our students, of our student centered approach is basically outcomes based approach. We basically actually take care of the students' well being. Whether we fo our focus is basically whether or not you as a student actually have learned something from the professors. So that's the, actually the focus of the United States right now, going on particularly in teacher education program. Could you move the uh, slides to, to the very, very last? So I will skip all of this, the very last. More, yes, no, the last one. So I will ask you again, are you a good teacher or are you a good teacher educator who seriously cares about your students' learning? Do you deserve to be in a noble profession called teaching? What do you think? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Yokari Amos. Uh, it was very interesting, uh, enlightening, perhaps, for some of you. Uh, uh, that basically encapsulate, yeah, uh, what the research trend says in teacher education. So you are, uh, you just heard about something that the cutting edge in teacher education, but I'm sure everyone is different in perceiving the information that they heard from the presentation. So I would like to open a, a Q and A session for participants here. Please you raise your hand. Uh, we have actually quite an ample time for a Q and A session. So why don't you take the opportunity? uh to us while uh professor yukari is here and available uh dr destina and uh, mas naufal yes and uh, numan uh ibu maifalinda supriono so i'm gonna just take note for now but i'm gonna uh, let you one by one and ask the question uh dr destina dr destina is one of our faculty member this Thank you very much, Butati, for the opportunity. Uh, thank you very much, Buyukari. Uh, I call Bu. Here we normally call Bu. 
Now, Madam Yukari. <laughs> Very interesting topics. Uh, I reflect back from like all the this kind of about 30 minutes uh, from your speech. Uh, there are two things that I pay attention here. We have uh, we have a concern on uh, teacher educators and also if I come to the context of Indonesia and also the teachers that already in service or they're already a teacher. So uh, in the case of your explanation, we, we start thinking as edu teacher educators here, like me, myself as a teacher educators, so many things that we want to develop or change to be a better educators for our students so they can be a good teachers. Now, my concern is more into uh, the teacher in Indonesian context that they already teach at school. Uh, the fact that uh, Indonesia itself, we face a, like quite a huge challenge uh, that our teachers has less capabilities on the four, four things that you mentioned earlier about the, the professional competence of a teachers uh, in Indonesia about their belief, motivation, self-regulation especially, and also field-specific knowledge. So I'm asking your insight. So if we are in a position of looking at our teachers, they're already on a field with their quite less capabilities to achieve that uh, competence, that their beliefs is not really high, their motivation low, and their self-regulation is questioning, and also maybe content knowledge may be quite good since they are coming to their field even though some are not so do you have any suggestion or insight on how we help our teachers with the minimum possibilities which part that we need to up uh, focusing more whether is it self-regulation is best or if we can't we can't pursue four of them the belief the motivation the self-regulation or the knowledge uh Put it up high what is the focus that we need to put to help our teachers perform better uh, so we have a very similar situation as well in the united states and in japan as well so in a teacher education of course we focus on future teachers correct we call it teacher candidates but at the same time and these teacher candidates in a Right now, the current teacher education program goes through this training, correct, with a new outcomes-based approach, correct, uh, which is good. However, yes, I agree with you, already teaching, correct, those people who are already teaching, that's a really hard one because they are already teaching and they have been teaching for the same thing for such a long, long time, correct? Like in, in the United States, it's uh, pretty common. You start teaching, for example, at kindergarten and then 30 years later, you're still teaching kindergarten in the same building. In the United States, this really happens, correct? So it, that's a very good question actually, because I feel the same way. It's very, uh, I shouldn't say easy, but it's easier to train future teachers than those people who have been already in teaching, correct? But at the same time, uh, I'm pretty sure Indonesia has the same kind of system to actually professional development, correct? For current, uh, correct, existing teachers, correct? That's one way to rigorously retrain those people who have been teaching for a long, long time. And also another way to think about is those of you who are going to be teachers pretty soon, you again have a chance to change those current teachers once you start teaching, correct? So, but at the same time, it's a very, very difficult situation. Uh, every single country is, uh, I'm, I'm actually witnessing, I agree. But at the same time, it's a challenge. At the same time, it's an opportunity as well, correct? Challenges are always opportunity as well. So one thing is a professional development uh, system uh, that needs to be taking place. I'm pretty sure you do, correct? Yeah, rigorous one. And also with new teachers who are coming in, they will need to be a change uh, agent to those current teachers. Not that the current teachers are very bad, correct? <laughs> Budestina, do you think that satisfies your question? Uh, you can yeah, follow just up. Just a little, so, a little yeah. comment. Yeah, we have PD for it's uh, PD for teachers is happening like long, long time ago as well. But the thing is, PD it might be need to be concerned as well uh, how effective it is uh, for our teachers because we keep on changing the techniques, methods, so many things. But yeah, it might not always. Uh, 
I think the things that we need to concern is not the whole country works for one type of BD, looking at how our geographical types of so huge Indonesia with a different context. So I think the things that we need to pay attention is on the PD itself, uh, whether certain PD is uh, works for Javanese, uh, for maybe Sumatra or maybe uh, other islands. It might be that things that I think I need to concern for next. Thank you so much for the comment. Sure, PD stands for professional development, if you are not really <laughs> familiar with the term in teacher education. Uh, thank you, Bu Destina. Uh, indeed, in, you know, in the teacher education research, uh, in-service and free service teachers, uh, when it comes to teacher education, we try it's really hard emphasizing on uh, pre-service to our uh, future teachers because that uh, it's more malleable to, it's a lot of opportunities to teach, uh, prepare uh, future teachers that is, you know, more in line with the current research and more uh, paradigm because that's very hard when you change the paradigm of teaching. Uh, next to the second one, I noticed uh, uh, Panova, right? Numan, yeah. uh, I think you are the second one, but you got the mic already. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. Since you had the mic, uh, um, you, um, Numan is from Pakistan, and it's one of our students. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Yokari, uh, for such insightful presentation. Uh, being teacher in three very, uh, in three countries, different countries like Pakistan, Thailand, and China, uh, I do agree with professional development. But still, like Thailand, they have a good set of professional development. But still, I find a lot of problems in their uh, teaching as well. Uh, my question is like, what's your reflection on how one can be a good teacher? Almost, I think 50% of answer is already covered in the first question. But my second question like related to this is, is it only professional development or if it is towards side, like is it to competencies or towards performances? Because I have seen many teachers, they are competent enough, but their performance is not good. So, uh, like, please elaborate these two points, that to which side we actually need uh, development. Thank you. You got the question, right? Would you like to uh, summarize his yeah, question? The first or the yeah. second? Yeah. You're talking about the professional development in Thailand, right? It seems like it didn't really work or what happened? <laughs> So he was skeptical about uh, professional <laughs> development to make it short. Uh, the second one is about the competencies or something to do with pedagogical content knowledge. He's very competent, but then the something to do with that. So. Uh, I was, yeah, I will combine both of you. Yeah, professional PD alone doesn't make anybody a good teacher, correct? Don't you think so? Correct. So what do you think? What do you think? You must have your own opinion to your question as well, don't you? Yeah, could you tell me? Cannot be a teacher. Cannot yeah. be a teacher? Uh, so uh, I believe that competencies, it is minor as compared to the performance of teacher within a class, but we basically focus on the competencies. So how can, is the situation in Japan and in America? Because I don't, uh, I have no experience of these two countries. Uh, please elaborate your answer on uh, these two countries so that may be a specific one. Thank you. Uh that's a very interesting point. Competency, yes. So in America, when we do a teacher education, it's all about competency, competency, competency. Standards one, standards two, standards three. A teacher candidate must to have da 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 da. Correct. Those are competency. Correct. But as I said in my during my presentation, just because you go through the same teacher education program and go through the same competency based program, that doesn't mean we will produce the same teachers, correct? Because teachers, all of you are different, correct? So that's when the teachers, each teacher's beliefs, motivation, all of those characteristics come in, right? So 
It's a very interesting question. I, I would like to write an uh, article actually about this with you. It's very interesting, yeah. So how does a competency-based teacher education produce actually a performative quality teachers? Don't you think so? Yeah, I do. And I have also written the paper on this uh, thing. <laughs> that was actually asking a question on the, that what are basically the competencies in Chinese and Pakistan's teachers and how Thailand basically working on the performance of a teacher. Yeah. And also you have to think about the teaching context as well, right? Each society has a very, very different teaching context. Like in the United States, if you're a teacher, you will see lots and lots of diverse students, correct? And also it's a race issue, ethnicity issue, class issue, all kinds of things come in in the United States. If you're a teacher like me, correct? Uh, I'm a teacher educator in America, correct? And I'm obviously an Asian woman, but most of the teacher candidates are white students, correct? White people. So they perceive me very differently, right? So all kinds of those teaching contexts in each scenario uh, is very different. And that produces very different outcomes of teaching as well. So that's, ve that's very interesting, isn't it? That's why teaching is so fascinating to me. Very different. Competency-based competency, but the performance part is very different because we had different people, different students in each scenario. Thank you. I, I really like your topic. Thank you. Thank you, Numan. That's uh, very interesting to hear you speak more. <laughs> I would like to see you. It's quite uh, insightful, actually, Numan. Yeah. Uh, uh, Pa Nova from Sunan Kalijaga, uh, State Islamic University. Thank you very much. Salam, salam nama saya. My name is Muhammad Naufal Waliuddin. I came from State Islamic University of Sunan Kalijaga, Yogyakarta. Thank you very much. Arigatul Gozaimas for insightful Prof. <laughs> Yukari. Insightful and inspirational speech from your paper. But I would like to give question perhaps based on my personal experiences as a student in Indonesia. But I will not over generalized but based on my personal opinion there are so many perhaps i could say feudalistic teachers or some kind of megalomaniac professor or that their opinion is was the right one and if we give the opposite opinion they will not how to say act as the same way to the another the agree one but I don't know how to explain the educational system in United States and the Japan, but in Indonesia, I have, I have ever watched that white society. Do you ever watch these movies? That white society, Robin Williams, that white society. And I have ever watched too the, the DW documentary from the German, is the, the German Dutch well media, documentary about education, the school in the cloud. Professor Sugata have investigated about the specific, such as moral panic between teachers and the shifting system of learning and education in this current age, in the digital revolution, the school in the cloud. So how do you think the adaptation and the new approaches or adjustment in educational system, which is fit in Indonesia maybe, to dispel or to dispel the feudalistic characteristic of those older, older, oldest generation perhaps, because you know, in millennial generation and generous Gen Z, Z generation is more vibrant and flexible and egalitarian way instant yeah. way and so forth thank you and what do I you we got the, the question yeah that, that's another interesting question so i will ask our friend tati to answer your question yes you put me no, no, no. <laughs> okay. uh, i think it is relevant to the one that you are referring to that uh, traditional teaching and then first the outcome base and then these day universities uh it is 
the trend is more and more to adopt the outcome-based education and also uh, motivated by the DICTI, uh, higher education, uh, the Ministry of Education would like to have the outcome-based education applied in the university across Indonesia. So uh, one of which the impact will be uh, the traditional method, including the feudalistic professor, uh, probably would not survive. Yeah, they have to adapt. Uh, otherwise, they will perish or uh, got sink. Yeah, uh, they would not survive in this era. So eventually, because we have to adapt, uh, this is becoming a policy in the Ministry of Education that the outcome based based. That's why Professor Yukari is coming here for you know an extended time, just to share with us for the faculty in the Faculty of Education to share about the international accreditation and one of which is the outcome based. So we are trying to be more uh, adaptive. Yeah, we don't want to be irrelevant. Uh, this international university, we want to be in the front. So as a student, when you encounter such a professor, how would you feel? I'm sorry, please. Uh, so your... when you see those professors, uh, how would you feel as a student? No, I'm not a student of oh, this I'm university, sorry. but I, I just feel this international class is full of egalitarian values and so cross-cultural dialogue and so forth. But based on my previous experiences in undergraduate students, so I have met not all, but so many older generation of the professors still have those characteristic of federalistic kind of like that. Uh, so in America, we have a very, very rigorous tenure system. Uh, it's a paying for system. Uh, one of this in the one of this system teaching is, of course, is one of them teaching and scholarship and service. And these days, all university in America because of the student-centered approach and outcomes-based approach, teaching part is really, really scrutinized. Every single professor is teaching. And one of the criteria is student evaluations uh, instructors comment. So we actually really look at it. Student comment, what kind of comments students make to particular teachers? Of course, again, teaching context is different, correct? Different each time. But uh, that's one of the criteria we use to evaluate a professor's teaching, whether or not this particular student is really based on outcomes-based approach or it's just a traditional approach, right? And then we try to, uh, in a tenure system, we try to motivate those professors to be more adaptable to the new way of teaching. And of course, again, another PD comes in from the university as well. So we're trying pretty hard to make our professors <laughs> to be more adaptable, to be more flexible, to be student-centered as much as possible. But, you know, higher education is notorious about slow changes because particularly education, don't you think so? Yeah, changes are slow, but at the same time, it's coming in gradually. That's my hope. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Yugan. Thank you, uh, Mas Nova. And the next one is Bu Mai Falinda. I think you raise your hand, yeah, Bu. Yeah, go ahead, take the time. Okay, thank you for uh, Prof. Amos and uh, Ms. Tati. Uh, I'm Mai Falinda Fatra, I'm a lecturer. I have been uh, teaching for uh, 25 years teaching and guide student in learning practice. And now uh, the uh, presented in online learning, problem in online learning. Uh, as a professional teacher, how to control learning at home for student uh, and uh, order learning objective? Cause uh, the student different uh, facilities and student at home different uh, community and other. Can you explain about a uh, good experience uh, in, uh, in America? Thank so you. during the pandemic, uh, we all professors really had a hard time changing our courses to completely online because we needed to do it. And I am not sure if your university has a clear online system, online teaching. Yes. Do you? 
we started our first cohort of students during the pandemic. So everything was online. How, what kind of online modality? What kind of online? We only use Zoom, just the you Zoom one. Zoom. We didn't only... have any infrastructure yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> you only use Zoom. So in America, I'm pretty sure almost all higher education institutions in America has a so-called online course, which is a, we call it Canvas or Blackboard. It's a software you can use actually. Every single class is, has a course shell. We call it shell. So I can show it later uh, if we have a laptop. So this course shell online, uh, we build into our courses. And then in this particular course shell, we have a Zoom, we have Microsoft T, we have other uh, Blackboard Ultra, all those are online courses. So you have to have this course shell, we call it Canvas or Blackboard, in order to be successfully uh, transmitting knowledge or uh, delivering your course to students online. Zoom alone wouldn't do because a Canvas shell can do lots and lots of things. In interactive discussion board, for example, students here and students here, students here simultaneously actually can type, your, type their opinions or even talk to each other. Uh, that type of thing is necessary in order for you to do online effectively. And that's something your university has to purchase. Uh, Tati. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Zoom alone is not going to be uh, effective. Unfortunately, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you need to have a solid online structure to be really successful. Uh, then in America right now, because of the pandemic, lots of students actually prefer online because we are getting good at it actually <laughs> delivering online courses really good at it because we have so much training as well and uh, we use zoom we use atra we use all kinds of learning modality online modality and it's very flexible for students as well so if you have your university has such an uh, online learning system it's uh, in collaboration with Zoom or other uh, Microsoft Teams, for example, that would be really wonderful. But that's a necessity, essential thing. Let me ask you, uh, how long did it take for you to get used to the system? Because you know the pandemic hit us very quickly and we didn't have much time just to so, get ready. Even before the pandemic, uh, in the United States higher education, we began using Canvas Shell about I've been teaching for 16 years in higher education, even before I started teaching higher education, we have been using those canvas shell. So it wasn't a big drastic change. We just needed more solid uh, refined training when the pandemic began. So it's easy, boys. It's pretty easy to actually get used to actually canvas. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We need to learn more about that and uh, advise the, uh, our IT guy just to get exposed with that kind of thing. Bu uh, my Falinda, did it satisfy you? Okay, uh, Supriyana, I guess you are the next. Check. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity, uh, Dr. Chati, and um, thank you very much as well for Professor Yukari Amos for the insightful explanation. So um, my question is related to the importance of uh, discussion between teachers and students, and I would like to con contextualize it with uh, how Santran. Uh, Santran is like a traditional form of uh, educational institution in Indonesia. Uh, we call it as well as Islamic boarding school. And uh, what I noticed from the way a uh, person trying to teach, uh, it's not all, but most of them is kind of like more into instructional uh, teaching and learning, where uh, uh, they don't highlight uh, what is called as a discussion between the teachers and, and the students. And there's also a concept called baroka, which is like, it's like a, a blessing, things like that. So if you kind of like object the teacher's opinion, if you kind of like uh, disagree with the teacher's opinion, it seems like you will not get that baroka, things like that. So my question is, um, 
how uh, what is your opinion about about this thing uh, it is interesting to see uh, your perspective considering that you are an outsider and uh, uh, another question is how uh, what is your suggestion uh, to kind of like um what is it called to to change uh, uh, this kind of um, uh, practice which is like it may i may say that it's it may relate to the culture it becomes a culture and norms in the past century itself so yeah that's my question thank you professor that's an interesting question so in in order for you to learn something don't you think you need to discuss with somebody who has a higher knowledge skills correct don't you think so and uh it's again, it's a very uh, interesting. You guys have been giving me lots and lots of great, uh, but also challenging questions. Uh, in America, I've been giving from you, uh, from American context. In America, professors, students, I want to say equal, professors always higher than students, correct? But at the same time, it's pretty common that the students and professors can have meaningful discussion at the same level and on an equal basis. And the students don't usually, unlike those professors you saw in the slide, usually students express their opinions really freely to professors. And then that is the foundation of US higher education. That is why US higher education is considered very, very rigorous, correct? Because students can express their opinions and the professors are receptive to it, correct? And I think that's kind of freedom, don't you think so? Students should be able to express their opinions about learning, of course, respectfully, <laughs> respectfully to the uh, professors. But professors should be doing the same thing to the student, correct? But again, it's a cultural context as well. And I'm from Japan. I cannot imagine doing the same thing in Japanese higher education. Because Japanese uh, college students tend to believe that professors' knowledge is something they need to admire, correct? Right? And they will never, ever think about expressing their opinions to professors, right? So this is something about each society has very, very different culture of learning. Don't you think so? And I cannot give you one right answer. But at the same time, you have voice. And uh, no matter what the professors think of you, just tell them what you think, because you are the one who wants to learn, and they are the one who should be helping you learning. Don't be afraid. That's one of the things that we encourage our students in the classroom. So regardless of what you have, want to share, uh, please try to speak up or raise your yeah, even share some ideas because that's the thing that encourage you to learn something new every time. Otherwise, you are going to sit silent and be passive. Uh, so I encourage the student all the time. And then I think it will be a lot different when they are instead of keeping quiet and then enjoying or even listening to what other people are discussing, they are becoming a part of the discussion itself. So uh, again, student, be engaged in the classroom because it always facilitates your learning. Yeah. And uh, professors themselves can uh, give you lots of different ways for you to express your opinions. If you're not so, for example, if you're very quiet, correct? You don't want to express your opinion in classroom. We actually use uh, at the end of the class uh, mini notes, and you can literally write down what your expression, what your uh, you know thinkings are. And then turn it into, just write down, and turn it into a professor. And then professors can respond back. That's another discussion, correct? It may not be happening synchronously, but it does happen. And those things can actually uh, happen in a discussion board in an online class. And those students who are really quiet, who usually don't speak out, love those online classes because they are free to express their opinions, right? So... Professors themselves have to be creative about how to give students more expressive venue to express their opinions. Supriyana, do you think that's it? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, attendances, we still have uh, one or two people. Uh, <laughs> Poppy. <laughs> and then that 
yeah, you with the black shirt. <laughs> uh, Poppy, please. Thank you, Utati, for having me. Uh, the question and then Prof. Yukari Amos is a great presentation. I love this so much. I do agree with you that teaching is a noble profession, but uh, when we are a teacher in the higher education learning, I think it's not really a matter because we are facing adult learners that they have, let's say, high motivated or something like that. But my question is, uh, but when we come to the uh, lower level such as primary or uh, junior high school or as a kindergarten teacher based on my experiences when i was becoming a teacher in kindergarten or primary school uh, we teach the students but in other times we also teach parents actually prof you can almost uh, when we have the problem with our child our students let's say we will face the parents also as well and then in some moments let's say in in indonesia we have some different levels of school let's say like middle uh, high class for community of parents in the high level school the school committee sometimes they have tendency for parents involvement so uh, let's say we uh, we cannot do uh, our freedom to our children about that because there is a, an involvement from parents of their children when we have the problem with the students or something like that so can you give us some let's say some insight uh, when we have to deal with the condition because in the lower level of education i think we teach not only the students not only children but also their parents as well thank you so much prof Yukari. wow what do you think oh uh, ah. okay um let me repeat the question. Yeah, it's something to do with the, the lower class. Seems to be uh, your question is about parental involvement. Yeah, yeah. In the what so called middle class uh, school, there's the parents seems to be involved a lot and then having their opinions on how to teach their children. And the lower class um, parents they tend to be quiet and then let the teachers do whatever they need to do. Is that correct? Yeah. So your question will be, what is the question? Uh, so when we have the problem with that, uh, how to deal with the condition? Uh, since we are teachers, so we have to have the power to our students, to our children in the classroom. But in otherwise, in other condition, we also need uh, parents will evolve to our uh, to our interaction in the classroom so when we face this problem what should we do as the teacher since sometimes the school also involved they have tendency to the parents involvement moreover in my case prof that when we have the problem with the children sometimes parents come to the committee to the, to the school committee and force them to let's say uh, uh, ask the teachers to go out from the school it happens in some schools in so Indonesia. With the PTA in the US, when you are like more educated and more opinionated teachers, uh, parents, they tend to be, you know, very aggressive and then. That's also happened in USA, too. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is a reality that's uh, happening in the United States uh, because of the previous president <laughs> we have. We have Biden right now, but the previous president, uh, critical race theory, which is my theory, uh, you always use, uh, is heavily attacked because of the previous president. Then the it's Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I will even name him. <laughs> so uh, because of him, then what's happening in the United States right now is United States is education system very very different it's a local control it's a loosely federally control but it's a fundamentally it's a local control each school each school district has a, a school board so parents 
so it's getting really political in the United States, education. So parents, for example, go to the school board meeting and, or go to the school and tell the teachers or tell the principal that, that they don't want their children to learn something about, let's say, slavery that happened a long, long time ago. Slavery is a fundamental history of the United States. I think everybody should be learning the fundamental fact, correct? But some parents disagree with it. Some parents think that they should, their children should, be, should not be learning anything about not, uh, slavery. So it's getting really political, right? But at the same time, children do have a right to learn. That's my opinion and shouldn't be dictated by parents. But it's a sensitive topic, don't you think so? It's very sensitive. You have to keep your job at the same time. So it's a very difficult scenario. It's a very difficult situation we are in right now, I should say. But at the same time, you as a teacher have power over children, right? And again, I should, I should say you shouldn't be afraid of parents. You shouldn't be afraid of top people. But you have a, you have a power. You have power over children. You're a teacher, right? And of course, these difficult things happen. These political things. I'm I'm having a hard time talking about critical race theory to certain students or certain parents as well. But I'm not going to give up my belief that I think students need to learn something about slavery, right? And that I will just stick to it, no matter what happens. But it's very difficult. Yeah. I think the standpoint, because you're, you're trained to become a teacher, teacher, right? Now you're a teacher, you're a teacher education student. <laughs> you are, you hopefully you're becoming a teacher educator in the future. But uh, what Professor Yukari just said was, uh, you have the power, the space is yours, the pattern perhaps sometime joining in, sometime making concern, but you have the space, you have the time. So, uh, uh, and you know what is right to teach to the, the children. So if you need to have a right balance, but you need to be believe in yourself that you are doing the right thing because you know, you are getting an education. <laughs> you, are, you are trained to become a teacher. So yeah, if you have more space yeah, to do what you believe in. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. We have to be powerful as teachers. All right. Yeah, you have the power. Uh, Mr. with the black shirt or the okay. dark shirt, uh, introduce your name and where you're from. Okay. okay. And make it quick. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Uh, thanks. My name is Anas Anwar Nasirin. I'm from the, I'm from the Bachelor of History Pajajaran University. And currently I'm the new student Master of History in the University of Indonesia. My question from my contemplation about my concentration science in, in the majoring of history. Majoring history in Indonesia is that is not a popular major to have the competitive for to already have the job in the community. About this the problem, I have the question how uh, what is the definition about the education and the institution and what is the definition about the education outside outside institution and how to find the result of both so that they can be implemented in the community yeah, thank you. bila pertanyaan saya kurang dimengerti Jadi pertanyaan saya ini, apakah definisi dari pendidikan di dalam institusi dan apakah definisi pendidikan di luar institusi? Dan bagaimanakah menemukan kedua hasil pendidikan tersebut sehingga dapat diimplementasikan di masyarakat? I don't know. <laughs> All right. Uh, Supriyana, can you just please translate it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, jadi uh, permasalahan right. itu. Oke, okay? you understand my question? Yeah, yeah. Supriyana can do that. Uh, Oke, okay. uh, Mas, uh, I would like to explain. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. 
what yeah uh, i understand the question so what he's trying to ask is actually uh, what is the difference uh, of definition between uh, of education in institutional education educational institution and outside uh, institutions institution. Is there any difference yeah, between? I think that's, uh, that will be the question that we, uh, Professor, yeah, can, yeah. can and, quickly answer. And how to be the implemented, yeah. impl implemented Thank in the society yeah. from yes. the, the results? Yeah, we try to answer yes. the question in such a short time. Okay. okay. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Different definition of education within the institution and outside of the institution. And how to implement it. Yeah. Uh, the real, sorry, the real problem. Uh, saya kuliah di sejarah dan sejarah itu bukan jurusan yang populer dan uh, begitu siap ketika keluar dari jurusan itu untuk bisa bekerja. Uh, Mas, actually uh, I'm not really sure that uh, this is uh, uh, Professor Yukari. Uh, all right, she try her best, but actually the focus of today's is oh. teacher education. Uh, not in education in general. Okay, so okay. she might uh, just want to focus on certain thing from okay. your question. Is it okay? Because we have very limited oh, yeah, time. Sorry. Oh, right. sorry for my question. It's so, oh, sure. Sure. Yes. Yes. Okay. Can we just approach Professor Yukari after we are done? Uh, because we are almost finished with the time and then the moderator, okay. oh, oh, sorry, the MC is already, they are standing. Uh, so please, please do that after the session is over. Uh, with that, uh, I might conclude the session with Professor Yukari today. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Yukari Amos, for the excellent uh, presentation and for sharing with us. Um, and then I'm going to turn this time to the uh, uh, Diva and then Zahra. Uh, Hazra. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much for such an interesting speech on teaching is a noble profession. Uh, without any doubt, teaching is indeed a noble profession. We would like to request our keynote speaker, Professor Yukari Amos, to receive a special package prepared by Indonesian International Islamic University. We also kindly request the Dean of the Faculty of Education, Professor Nina Nurmila, to give the package to our keynote speaker. We can talk now, no problem. Yeah, we can take this. At this point, we would like to inform all the participants that we are moving on to panel presentations. So panel presentation on higher education will be held at Telif conference room. So those who are interested in higher education, they can relocate to teleconference. The presentation will begin at 11 a.m. And those who are interested in uh, presentation on teaching and learning during the pandemic, uh, they can remain here. We will. Uh, the presentation will begin at 11 a.m. here at the theater room. See you shortly. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have completed the second round of panel presentations for the first Faculty of Education Annual Conference 2022. Uh, we have now reached the end of our conference. Uh, in the last two days, we have explored the richness of educational discussion from various perspectives. In order to close the first Faculty of Education Annual Conference 2022, it is now our pleasure to invite the Dean of the Faculty of Education for closing remarks. For Professor Nina Nurmila, the time and place are yours.
Thank you very much, Zerat and Diva. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Well, I would like to thank all of you who have already participated in this conference from the beginning until the end. Before the conference, I was worried well, how this conference would be. Well, I was afraid if there is no participation, but it turns out that I still see many people, many participants who are here. And the one of the keynote speakers, uh, Professor Abdullah Sahin, is still here. Thank you for being with us. Yeah. <laughs> so. In this final re re remarks, I would like to emphasize what I uh, said earlier this morning. Uh, maybe some of you who uh, do not come here yet, uh, that this conference will uh, be organized annually. So I'm uh, expecting that you will be still be able to participate in the next year conference, which ha will have different term. Yeah. And hopefully in these two months, we can announce uh, the term for our next uh, conference and also for the writing competition, yeah? Because uh, this annual conference and the writing competition are two ways for us to get the good quality of uh, writing, yeah? Uh, it's not easy to have the good quality of writing for journal publication, but Writing competition and a conference is one of the ways to attract uh, participation in writing. And I encourage you to write uh, because people who write must read, but people who read doesn't necessarily go to writing. And writing, uh, when you write and you publish, actually that's your amal jariah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, it will be long lasting, even though we have died, our writing can still be accessed by so many people. And with the writing, you can also be known publicly and can be invited to anywhere in the world, like Professor Sahin. He is Turkish and he is teaching in the United Kingdom. But today, because of his writing, his knowledge, he can be here in Indonesia. Yeah. I think some of you also have the same experience and I have also have a similar experience being invited to like to Europe, to America, to Australia because of writing. You, some of you here now still students and then still in the beginning of your career, but sooner or later when you write public, it is, it can be like worldly known and you can be invited anywhere in the world. Yeah. So please keep an eye on the, our invitation or call for paper and or writing competition uh, because a conference can make you uh, meet with other researchers, with other writers for you to plan ahead, for example, for collaborative research and publication. Yeah, I think that's all for me. I would like to close this conference, this annual conference of education uh, 2022 by reading Hamdallah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Professor Nina Nirmala. We hope that this event will not only inspire but will also be useful in education at various levels and in contemporary Muslim societies. Finally, after fruitful meetings and discussions during the last two days, we as the masters of the ceremony would like to sign off and thank you once again for your participation and support. We would also like to sincerely thank all the speakers, participants, lecturers, students, and everyone who made this conference possible. 
See you again next year at the second Faculty of Education Annual Conference 2023, insyaAllah. Thank you very much.